works for Cure Violence in New York, as well as some other things. I'm not going to give him a, 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 a big introduction because I know he's going to bring it big. Right? I, I know him very well, but I'm not going to give him a big introduction. So I'm going to let him introduce himself. He's going to spend some time with us. But um, please give a huge Allentown welcome to Anaje Moeed, who's dear to my heart. I don't, I don't know what he's going to do, but I know he's going to get you moving around. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Omar J. and uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you tonight. I would say that it's grief that brought you here because you lost loved ones, you lost family members, you lost friends, and you have seen and felt the pain of destruction. But I'd also like to say that you're here because you are inspired. The word inspiration comes from spirit. In spirit. You're spirited. And it's okay to hold both of those things at the same time. We can hold on to our grief and our sadness and we can also reach for the sky and turn to the sunlight and the joy. This is called the singing bowl. And I need someone to come in forward for me. I want to show you something. The bowl is made out of metals. And these metals have a certain vibration and they are aligned to different energetic centers in the body, which are called chakras. And when we sing the singing bowl, that's what it sounds like. How do we develop our families? How do we develop our community? 
Um, Carol is here. Carol and I met um, a number of years ago when we were going through a training called uh, Carol, what's the name of the training? Transformational Social Therapy. Transformation. Or the Diversity Leadership Program at Temple. But Transformation of Social Therapy, which is saying that we live in a sick society. And the results that we are experiencing is not the fault of the individual, it's in fact the society in which we're living in. And Charles Rossman, who created this particular way of thinking, said that violence can be at least four things. It can be mistreatment, it's gonna cause violence. It can come from abandonment, that's gonna cause violence. It can also come from humiliation. That's going to cause violence. And also blaming, right? Blaming and constantly mislabeling someone that's going to cause violence. In the world of social work, we call that microaggressions, where one aggression on top of another on top of another then it builds up and becomes cumulative and then there's an explosion. So this thing called violence is something that we're looking at maybe just the wrong way. If we were to say that, as Charles Rosman says, that violence is a default mechanism. And that is to say, we don't need to involve in conflict resolution, we need to involve in conflict. Why? Because we all don't agree on all the things all the time. Humans are very complicated. Right? I like chocolate, you like, like vanilla, somebody like strawberry. Okay, but we're gonna get butter, we can't, okay, fine. <laughs> so if we look at conflict as being healthy, the more conflict we can in, in, engage in, the more we can find solutions to whatever's going on. But when we avoid conflict, healthy conflict, then the default mechanism is violence. I'm here today, you said, why did I come over? I live in Lansdowne, but I work in New York. So why would I drive all the way from you know, New York to be with you today? It's because I'm related to you. Because I want your sons and your daughters to grow up the same way that I want my sons and daughters to grow up. And I'm also coming here to say to you, you're not alone. There are over 50, 75 cities across the world that's engaging in this process of understanding violence as a community as a public health problem. I'm here to say to you that any resources that I can provide to you, I'll hopefully be able to do that through my experience. I'm gonna share three scenarios. Well, let me, before I say the three scenarios, let me say that I too have uh, lost family members to violence. Not gun violence per se, but violence nonetheless, and death nonetheless, terminal. The first one is my daughter, who committed suicide in 1996. Because this cruel world in which we live, she couldn't find the compassion, and she couldn't find the solutions to our depression. She committed suicide in 1996, she was 25 years old. But I'll say to you, I'll say this to you, my grandson, her son, my grandson is 26 now, so you know I'm really loving that, right? But not without him being in college, asking his friend, could he get a gun? <coughs> because families who experience suicide have a higher probability of engaging it than a family that has it. But he's here and he's doing well, and that's a phenomenal story to tell. But it doesn't stop there. Ten years later, in 2006, my younger sister was murdered. So violence is not a stranger to me, and loss is not a stranger to me. And at that point, I decided that the trauma that was following me, I turned around and said, no, I need to follow you. Right? So when I went and got my post-master's certificate in trauma from New York University, that's what I wrote in my application. And I'm turning around and following the trauma that has followed me. And this is my invitation to you. 
is to take this opportunity to stay together. Humans, when we come together, we have four possibilities. Maybe more, but at least I think these four possibilities are foundational, and I haven't seen anyone to prove me wrong. The first possibility is the possibility of agreement. In another word, we can say consent. You've consented to be here, to be involved in this, this community forum, this, this uh, town hall meeting tonight. We all agreed to be here. But consent is not enough. Consent becomes functional when we enter into relationships with each other. That's when it becomes real. And that's when we get tested to see how long do I want to be in this relationship. Be it a personal one, be it a political one, or a social one. Well, you know, I, I wanted to go out with you, but I, never mind, thank you, no. Right? So, the second phase is relationships, building relationships. When we stay together long enough, doing good work together, we realize that we can accomplish some things together that we can't accomplish by ourselves. It's been said that illness can be transformed only if you take out the I and you put in the we, and illness becomes what? There you go, say it again. Wellness, illness becomes wellness when we take out the what I and we put in the we. And that's what you are here to do. So I want to talk about the side of the spirit, right? That inspiration. And you have to hold on to that because there will be many uh, disencouragements. There's going to be many obstacles. There's going to be many things standing in your way. And you have to hold on to the fact that not only can others, not only have other people who have succeeded in reducing violence, you've heard 50%, in some places it's been 75%. But you have to hold on to that it can happen right here in Allentown as well. So the last step is called abundance. We start with consent, we move into relationship, then we move into empowerment, that's the third one, empowerment. And, that, and then we go to the fourth level, and that's called abundance. That is, we start to experience the fruits of our labor. We begin to see our work, and then you know what? It starts all over again, and it goes up. So this transformative relationship is why you're here. That's the purpose why you're here. You're talking about not just a question of stopping violence, you want peace. You want transformation. Now when we talk about transformation, we're saying it's a little more complicated because it's not a quick fix. It's going to take time. So the three scenarios I'm going to share with you. The first one is in a small town called Chester, Pennsylvania. Anybody